Okay, okay, now it's red. Okay. Okay. This will be red. Okay. All right, so um, I'm gonna start off where I left off and I'm assuming that people either well, paid attention or did not. Um, and I want to start with the question of what are the dominant uncertainties on a measurement of jets? Like, this is this is something I think every experimentalist should think about because if you want to do a better measurement, that's where you should start. Um, so here is a one-page slide summarizing what the analysis steps are um, for a reconstructed jet measurement. You start out with your tracks and clusters and whatever quality cuts you put in, you, you put on those, you yeah. throw this into a jet finding algorithm, you get yeah. jet candidates, you do your background subtraction. This gives you a raw jet spectrum. Um, and here I just used the Elise spectrum after you've applied a constituent cut. And, um, then you have to correct this raw jet spectrum and you do this with a procedure called unfolding and what that means is that you're taking uh you, you have a response matrix like this which um gives the correlation between the measured jet momentum or energy and the true jet momentum or energy and um this response matrix will in general, correct for multiple effects at once. So it corrects the single track reconstruction of for energy resolution and also for background fluctuations. And then you get this corrected spectrum. And people throw the word unfolding around a lot and seldom explain. So the basic problem is that your direct measurement is not exactly what the right answer is. You have all of these messy detector effects. Um, so you can quantify that in, in by relating your true, your actual measurements. So this is the new, the vector new in this equation. In the case of a spectrum, that would be the number of jets in a given momentum bin. So each of the entries in the vector would be a different momentum bin. Um, mu is the distribution of true values. Um, and you can have a background. Um, and then this R is the response matrix, which tells you if you have a true, for instance, if you have a true a jet with a true momentum of 100 GeV, what is the probability, you know, the distribution of different bins that you would measure that in? So you might measure it 50% of the time in the 100 to 110 GeV bin, and maybe 25% of the time in the 110 to 120 GeV bin. And you have this whole distribution. And the actual thing that we know reasonably well with all of our detector simulations is the response matrix for going from the true values to the measured values. But that's the easier direction. You ideally would, what you really need to do for a measurement is the equivalent of inverting the matrix. And the problem with inverting the matrix is that if you have a response matrix, which was, there, there's many problems, but if you have a response matrix generated, for instance, from a Jayant simulation of Pythia events going through your detector, there's going to be finite um, a finite number of entries. There's statistical fluctuations in that response matrix. There's gonna be regions where you have no entries at all because, um, because you just didn't have enough simulations, even though the answer is not that no 100 GeV jets would be measured at 200 GeV, it's just a very small percentage. So in general, inverting this matrix is not numerically stable. And what you do, so that's the simple solution is inversion. 
Um, you can do a matrix inversion and it's not always a terrible answer. If you have very high statistics in your response matrix um, and your response matrix is, I don't want to say diagonal, but it has to, you know, there has to be a, it matters less if they're exactly on the diagonal than if there is a linear relationship between the true value and the measured value. And if that's mostly true, this is easier to do. Um, but this is not stable. So the most common procedure, I'm not gonna go through all of the lines in this, but you use, the most common procedures are one called the, called Bayesian unfolding, where you start with a prior. So usually what you would do in a proton-proton measurement is that you would measure, uh, you would use Pythia as the prior, um, and then you use Bayes' theorem to invert the response matrix, and you do this iteratively until it starts to look, until you think it's okay, um, except that, you know, if it's a stable solution, you'd see after multiple iterations, it converges on the right solution. Um, the algorithm has some numerical instability, so what you'll actually see is it will start oscillating between solutions. The common um, implementation of this algorithm is in a package called Rue Unfold. Um, actually, the author came up with an update to that algorithm, which has not yet been implemented, which probably is more stable, and we should probably all start using that instead, except that his implementation is written in R, and physicists do not know R. Um, so, if you ever have to do this, you should dig up the ugly paper that was, it's a, sorry, it's a fine, lovely paper, but it is dense. And if you have to do unfolding, you have to spend some quality time with these unfolding papers. Um, you will see, so these are some, actually out of some test code for RU Unfold, just to show that it works. Um, so the um, truth is in, sorry, the truth is in blue, um, the measured value is in red, and the black points show what you get reconstructed. Um, so it does on average, and but this is the co correlation matrix, so this is this is where it's roughly diagonal and there's a there's little off diagonal um, component then it works beautiful and it works fantastic. You have problems as soon as you, um, it actually doesn't matter if it's diagonal as long as there is a dominant um, term and it is, um, and it is at least the dominant term is roughly linear with the, um, with the, between the true value and the measured value. Okay, my uh, animations here failed a little bit in the end, so bear with me, but about unfolding. First of all, the author of Bayesian, the Bayesian unfolding algorithm says that you should unfold, you should avoid unfolding if you possibly can. And I think that that is something that we should take to heart. Usually if someone tells you not to use the method that they developed, that's if you don't have to. <laughs> That's warning you. Um, I have seen a tendency in our field to make the assumption that if someone has done unfolding, they have done a better measurement. And if you really understand your corrections and your systematic uncertainties, then you don't necessarily need to do unfolding. When do you need to do unfolding? When, um, a good guide is when your experimental resolution is poor. So if you're measuring single particle spectra, the um, uncertainty track by track in the momentum is usually small compared to the bin width. So um, in at least the uncertainty is 0.5%. Uh, I actually don't know off the top of my head what it is for Phoenix, 
but the bin width is still, it, it, for single hadron spectra, the bin width is large compared to the momentum um, track by track. For jet spectra, the resolution is on the order of the bin width. So um, because of the nature of jet measurements, it's really hard to get the jet's momentum or energy measured much better than about 10%. So that means if you're measuring a 100 GeV jet, if you want to be able to have bins that are on the order of 10 GeV, you need to do unfolding. And the reason is that those, um, I think I may move inside. The reason is that those um, those jets are going to get smoothed, smeared around. Oh. Hang on. Just a second. It is, it is, it is, oh, 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 oh. Okay, I think that does it. Sorry about that. Um, you get bin to bin migration in, if your resolution is poor track by track. So um, a lot of those 100 uh, jets are going to Excuse me, I have a question, sorry. Uh, yes, please. Okay, so uh, for the basic method, I mean, it's it's like an iterative method, and the next is uh, maybe possible to use some great gradient great descent method, such as, uh, for example, we first get the derivative of u du over dv. And every time we just uh, put into a truth information U to get a V, then we see the difference between uh, this V and uh, our measurement V. And then we multiply by the gradient we get from du over dv and add it to the uh, tr uh, truth information, the trial truth information uh, U to get the next iteration. It's just, just like how, how we train the neural network. We use the bad propagation and the gradient descent, and it's, it's just uh, every time we uh, propagate by the slope times the difference of the uh, measurement v and uh, to get the next iteration. I mean, f first we, you, you know what, what I mean, right? I'm not sure I understood every word you said. You're talking about using a neural network to do the unfolding? No, no. I mean, using the same idea. So, for example, we get uh, we get v equals r u, right? So first, we try uh, v zero. We we put u equals some trial trial value u zero. We get v zero equals r u zero. Then we can calculate v, uh, uh, our difference between uh, v0 minus what we really measured v signal. And we multiply this derivative of du over dv to get uh, the delta u. And we add this delta u to our u0 to get our u1. And we just put u1 into it and uh, get v1, and the next we iterate, get v2, every time multiplied by the slope of du over dv times the delta v, every time we iterate to the next value. I think it's like, uh, I mean, like, uh, every time we follow the slope to close to the truth value uh, of, of u. So I I think parts of that are what? sort of like 
Bayes' theorem. And I think um, the Liu one fold does exactly what Zongling mentioned. It's just wrapped up into a nice package, but it exactly goes through these iterative things because one of the parameters you can give is essentially this number of iterations that yes. it can go. And especially when you're talking about, and as you said, you know, when you reach unstable equilibrium, like, you know, when it just basically keeps above and below the true value and never really reaching the true. I don't know much about this, but I didn't, uh, I have done it the way Zongling is talking about, more mm -hmm. brute force, looking at it at the matrix level and more brute force doing it. But that's because I couldn't figure out how to make Rue unfold work. But uh, that was gonna be my question. Do you have a grad student who I could bug about this and ask? Uh... Yes. His, okay. his name is Will, Will Witt, um, and email me, and I will send you his email address. Um, I don't think that, yeah. I'm not sure if, Bayes, if the implementation of the Bayesian method does, um, does the thing with derivatives to come up with a clever second guess. I would have to go over the details again myself. Um, and to, to remember exactly what it does. I the see. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe this method, my method is too basic and time consuming, I think. I think it's, yeah. I mean, the method that, um, improvement that D'Agostini wrote about in his um, follow up paper was not actually that hard there were there were a couple things um, that were reasonably complicated that used uh, Dirichlet distributions which is why he implemented it in R because those are native in R um, and not in Rue unfold but um, in reading the paper it actually indicates that the biggest difference is because in the iterative Bayesian method, what's done in Rue unfold is that you use the results from one iteration as the prior for the next iteration, which makes sense. But that's why you can get statistical fluctuations because your prior for the um, second iteration is now no longer smooth. And so you can get more stability by imposing smoothness on the um, on the output of the first iteration before you call it the input of the second iteration. And his papers indicate that that is actually the big difference in why his improved algorithm is more stable. I see. Um, so, so you mean the key point in Bayesian is we have a good uh, formula for the probability, right? So P, we should have a very good formula for that, and uh, it will converge very fast if we have. You, you mean that, right? I don't know if it will converge very fast. In his follow-up paper, he found that if you did in the new algorithm that it did. It was less likely to get into these wildly unstable points, so the the answer was oscillating less. Um, and I think it would certainly be good for the field if someone implemented this in C++ in some way, so it or in a root compatible way. Um, I might be trying to talk, I'm sort of trying to talk one of my grad students into doing it, but it's not necessarily a small task. Um, but it, a quick and dirty improvement to what's done in Ruin fold, Unfold would do something like impose smoothness, not, there are other algorithms like um, SVD, sing, singular value decomposition, which does impose smoothness on the answer, but I think you could actually get better performance with the Bayesian method if you impose smoothness before it's the prior for the next one, which probably involves a little bit of a hack where you use Rue unfold to get the first iteration, you smooth the result, 
and you use that as the prior for the second iteration. I okay, still would I still would warn people like there's you should not be doing this for charged pion spectrum charged pion spectra because there's it, it gets really complicated with an algorithm like this you end up with um, point to point non trivially correlated uncertainties um, and basically any of these unfolding algorithms are assuming that you have um, that your response matrix is correct. And what we do in practice when we're getting a lot of these uncertainties is that we change something like you change the efficiency, you generate a new response matrix and you see how the answer changes. And you can sort of get a feel for the correlation between uncertainties that way. Um, and you can treat the single track reconstruction efficiency separate from the calorimeter cluster energy uncertainty. Um, and Ruin, well, any of the pack, any of the algorithms in Ruin fold pretty much just dump it all in one basket. These algorithms are not aware of systematic uncertainties on the response matrix. So you kind of have to add it in by hand. Um, and and Ruunfold doesn't handle the statistical uncertainties on the data points either. So there's a sort of ad hoc procedure where you fluctuate your data points within the uncertainties in order to figure out what those statistical uncertainties are actually doing. Um, and yeah, so You know, so the algorithm is assuming the response matrix is, is correct. It corrects for multiple effects simultaneously. So it's difficult to disentangle effects. It leads to non-trivial uncertainty correlations, and it may not handle the systematic uncertain, uncertainties between different, uh, it may not handle the correlations between different uncertainties quite correctly. Uh, and it is as, as someone already mentioned, you know, Ruunfold is sort of an out-of-the-box package which you can use, but it's still not entirely trivial to use. So if you don't need to, don't do it. Sorry. And yeah. Sorry, sorry for interrupting, but <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, right. I, I actually put something in the chat box just for the heck of it, right? Uh, the Agostini paper is 1995. I put there a 1994 paper, but actually the method was worked out in uh, 1989 at the 814 experiment. And it was yours, yours truly who actually got into a humongous fight with Dave Lissauer and all the other participants on this paper who said that it's absolute nonsense and then ultimately they wanted to become co-authors. It's in the chat box. <laughs> So, we did so I'm not sure. So I'm sorry, I don't under. So your your position is which uh, this uh, this response matrix approach to the analysis of calorimetry data, right? So this has been worked out in 1989 and applied to the 814 data. Okay. And then we ultimately, after long, long fights, when all, all my beloved co authors said that it is sheer nonsense, and then in 94 it became a paper and they became co authors. So <laughs> I, I don't know if you, if you ever, ever met such a situation, but. <laughs> right, I was a grad student in 814. So I just wanted the conversation. I have frequently said that things are not worth doing or crazy, and then I end up doing them later. So yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty good predictor of what I'm going to work on is whatever I say is garbage. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, good. Which I take to mean that I am willing to learn. <laughs> yes, yes, so, yes. I just, uh, so again, at some point I should uh, dig back on my notes. But since you said uh, D'Agostini who invented and actually 
even uh, better <laughs> looking down when I, when I uh, no, it, it's not, uh, not only that this is an earlier paper, but uh, I don't want to take uh, all credit, right? Actually, in 89, when I learned this, I already have read very clever papers from Daisy and other places from 83, 85, which essentially pointed in this direction. Okay, so, so actually, it was a, as, as most, most ideas, right, it, it, it was a long, uh, long development. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you and sorry for the interruption. No, no, it's welcome. Um, so, in JETS in particular, there's an issue that comes up if you want to make comparisons to measurements because the response matrix um, is, has two main components. And the first one is the detector response. So, just how often do you reconstruct a, um, a track in the first place? And and if you have calorimeter clusters, how what is the ener energy resolution on them? Um, and this is a true detector effect. So there, so no um, theorist can actually do correct for this. They've they've pretty much got to you know we have to correct for this first part. But the second part is the corrections for these background fluctuations, and this is where it gets tricky because remember the last time I was saying, you know, these are dependent on, um, it, these will be different in different Monte Carlos. So now you could go with never ever correcting for background fluctuations, but then your raw measurement doesn't have very much meaning because a jet in heavy ion collisions would not even be vaguely comparable to a jet in proton-proton collisions. So I do think we should correct for it. Um, but you have to, you then have to have a couple of different models. So um, if you have a, a Monte Carlo like Pythia Angantir, which generates the entire collision, you would have to, um, you would have to correct the model for the fluctuations as well. If you have a model like Joule, which doesn't simulate the entire event, then um, it isn't gonna have these fluctuations. And then you have experiments like CMS have published some response matrices, but the response matrices that they've published are the product of these two components. So it includes both fluctuations and detector effects. So the idea behind publishing the response matrix and not doing the correction yourself is that a theorist could smear their calculation with the response matrix. Um, but that, <laughs> I think that is the, the unique case. The total response matrix is probably useful to no one because if you have a full Monte Carlo, then um, the fluctuations component is going to be different. And if you have a Monte Carlo like Joule that only simulates what's supposed to be the signal, then you don't have um, the same, then you don't even need the fluctuations to compare to the data. Um, the point of me mentioning this is I think the field has not done enough deep thinking about how you actually make a detailed comparison between a reconstructed jet and uh, a jet reconstructed in an experiment and, and some type of model. If, um, um, this is not really yeah. a question, but I'm just gonna frame a particular sentence and tell me if my understanding is correct. Um, Specifically for JET, because the, the reconstruction is so model dependent, the response matrix is so tunable in that sense, in, in some level, just because of the complexity of the JET, the, this entire procedure becomes, uh, I wouldn't say you can't rely on it, but becomes weaker to be used in this context than maybe in the context of the way we use it, like a calorimeter data with clusters and energy, which is more like first order, uh, you know, parameters that we have, physics parameters, in which 
the response matrix cannot be changed that much because it doesn't depend on much because it's like a it's basically the raw signal converted to with some understanding of that this is a photon or not that requires some algorithm but apart from that there is no not much algorithm that goes into it i is i think i agree statement? with you i think i agree with you but i would word it a little i, I always word it a little differently which is to say okay. that when you're talking about a calorimeter response we understand how an electromagnetic calorimeter responds to a photon very well mm -hmm. so if you're running using Jayant to get a response matrix for photons or even for pi zeros that decay into photons the assumption that you know the response matrix pretty well is probably pretty good mm -hmm. If you're, and I'm going to move back outside because it's more pleasant. <clears throat> Bear with me. Um, if you're doing this for jets, there's other effects that can come into play. Um, if you're doing it in proton proton collisions, it's reasonably under control because um, I, there's a lot we don't know about jets, but there's a lot we do know about jets. And Pythia is not bad, but you are sensitive to things like the fragmentation, how, how a jet fragments. So um, in your response matrix, if you have more, if, the, if nature has more um, pi zeros than your simulation, uh, let's say that nature has zero and 100% pi, your response matrix is going to be wrong. And especially when we're talking about the response of a hadronic calorimeter to it. Yeah, we don't understand this that well. If I may, uh, okay, give me, give me two minutes, please. please. Number one is that uh, there was a question in the chat box. Are you aware that we are seeing you all the time or uh, which is very nice, but do you want to show yourself oh. the slides? <laughs> we enjoy looking at you, but we don't see your slides. That's number one. Oh. And oh, the... that was not on purpose. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the response to Neil that actually now I feel a little bit less ashamed for this self advertisement which I put in the chat box. Because if you go back to this paper, our problem in 89 was that we were measuring uh, mostly, we had some particle identification, but we measured mostly transverse energy, okay? Which of course is a general uh, thing, right? And uh, it, it doesn't really care what is the particle composition. It just measures, it was an electromagnetic and a hadronic calorimeter, and it measures basically the total transverse energy produced by the particle. And now, of course, and NIF's question was actually very sharp, it is a crucial question that whether the event generator that you use to uh, produce your response matrix has a proper particle composition and, of course, the proper spectra for the uh, respective particles. And actually, if you go back to this paper, there is also uh, a couple of plots or remarks or whatever that we tried different kind of uh, event generators and tried to, uh, tried to uh, determine that what is the error coming from the fact that in, in practice, we don't really know how these individual events, which produce an apparent ET, how they are, uh, what, what is their composition? So what particles do they consist? So the question is very, very much in place. And the response matrix you are using in your photon analysis, uh, in itself, that's a perfect thing, right? Because photon, photon, you know the electronic response. Now. But the question is sharp, right? Whenever you now start to make a mix of particles, uh, Jean simulates the overall response. You are measuring the overall response, but of course it can change, or the worse still, it can be the same in principle for two completely different type of particle composition. 
Okay? So uh, there is all there uh, in this case there is always some remaining ambiguity. And again, this paper tried to uh, address this thing with 94 tools, uh, which were actually basically the different uh, event generators were very undeveloped back then. Today they are much uh, better, and as Christine pointed out, for instance, today nowadays, if you make a proton-proton collision, uh, whatever comes out of your generator is pretty much whatever comes out the true the proton-proton collision. But there are still ambiguities, so the question was very sharp and very tight. Thank you. Yeah, I and certainly when you do a jet measurement. In the experiments, they go around, they go in and they try to adapt these things and, and see how robust the response matrix is. It's not that this, these studies are not done. Um, I, I do think we should all be a little bit nervous about how well they really capture how well we know everything. And I also would critique my colleagues on the dearth of details in talks and papers about what actually was done. Was there a question in there somewhere? No. No, okay. just an enthusiastic agreement for, uh, with your critique. <laughs> and, you know, there's, so, We've talked a little bit about the assumptions about the detector response, including the particle composition, which includes fragmentation and hadronization. Also, you know, how wide is your gut? Um, and these fluctuations. There's another little subtle thing in there that I didn't realize until we started trying to play around with this as well. To construct a response matrix, you need to somehow match your true object to your reconstructed object. And this is, oh, this is not that hard, although not as trivial as it seems at first for something like a photon, matching a simulation of the detector response of a, to a photon to the photon itself. Um, you still can have these ambiguities in a Monte Carlo for a photon, but now we have this composite object that actually, ha so you have maybe 20 different particles and you're running a jet finder to cluster them, and you can end up with these gray areas where it's really not clear what the right reconstructed jet is for a simulated jet. And I had an undergrad who played around with this, and we'd find that if you're at about 50 GeV, if your jet is around 50 GeV, these ambiguities are at something like 1%. But if you push it down to 10 GeV, you get maybe 5% um, ambiguities where how we quantified that is we had three different methods and did it find the same jet every in every different method. Um, and the point I want to make there is, you know, this is another little subtle detail that is, it, if you're talking 100 GeV jets, everybody's going to agree on what we're talking about. <laughs> but as you push down lower, this stuff starts to matter. Um, and then here, this is the least jet momentum resolution. So 20%. Now, Elise is not an optimized to measure jets. Um, Atlas is, Atlas's nominal jet energy resolution is about 10%. This is still a far cry worse than the momentum resolution for the worst detector for a track. So you you just quite simply cannot measure jets as well as you can measure single particles. And that's because your jet is this composite object that has multiple particles and so, you know, you're going to have fluctuations in how many of them you actually measured. And, you know, the 
so here the red is these fluctuations, which I'm not sure really should always be in the same way as detector effects, but they are. Um, and then the blue is these detector effects. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Yes. So why is it that the plateau of the charged seems to be higher than, or I guess have worse resolution than the full? You see what I'm talking about? Yes. Um... I think that's because of the, what you also see is that the slope is a little higher on the detector effects for the charged. Um, the, when you, in Elise, the, you, what you're really measuring is, you're, there's not a full calorimeter, sorry. Um, there's not a full calorimeter, so you get the charged component from the tracking detectors, which are quite good. And then you get the, we always say that it's the neutral component, but what it really is, is the pi zero component, um, because we have almost no measurement of neutrons and K zero longs, it's, or lambdas in there, because we're cutting secondaries reasonably tightly. So it's really, pi zeros plus charged hadrons for full jets, but we're correcting it up to the energy for everything. So you're scaling up the energy by, on the left-hand side, by about a factor of 1.5 or so, a little less than 1.5. I think it's 1.25. Um, so the limitation in a lease with the charged tracks is that is the high PT tracks because the field is only half a Tesla compared to Atlas and CMS, which are, I believe, four Tesla. Um, so a 50 GV track reconstructed in a lease, it has something like a 10% momentum resolution. So basically, in, on the right-hand side, you become sensitive to that effect, that our track, our momentum resolution is crap at high PT. Yeah, if I if I may uh, add something, right? So uh, a calorimeter short of the leakage, longitudinal leakage, always gets better resolution. I mean, uh, the resolution is improving as you move higher and higher and higher and higher. Again, a part of leakage there is no exception, so it always goes down. On the other hand, I don't know of any charge tracks. As a charge tracking device in which the resolution wouldn't increase uh, with momentum. Right? The, uh, no matter what you do, right, uh, you are always measuring um, an R, right, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so and a bend, right, and this, uh, the bend itself is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So, no matter what you do, your measurement as you move up in P. Uh, will be worse, maybe just slightly worse, right? But it has to increase. So if the left is sort of a combination of a calorimeter which improves uh, with uh, energy and the charge tracks, right? And the right is only the charge tracks, then it's then to my eyes it sounds logical that the charge tracks get slightly worse as you move up, right? But the total gets better than the charge track because the calorimeter part of it is improving. That so, would be fine. Yeah. So that's only kind charged of. tracks and so not... The right is only charged tracks and then it's only corrected up to the energy con contained in charge tracks as well. So the x-axis on the left and the right plots are not entirely equivalent. I see, okay. And so it, in, at least with the electromagnetic calorimeter, so the 
most of the information is actually from the tracking and basically the algorithm it, it's a they tried to do a little we tried to do something a little more complex and it didn't really improve things much but basically if you have a track you use the information from the track and if you have uh if you don't have a track you're mostly you, you're using the calorimeter information because the lease has an electromagnetic calorimeter um, if a charge track leaves a deposit in the calorimeter it doesn't deposit its full energy so you don't get a huge bump in the resolution in a lease from the calorimeter you could with a hadronic calorimeter and then you get different effects so in CMS, they use something called particle flow, which briefly says, use whichever information you have about a track or cluster, about a particle, which you think is the higher quality information. Um, and that does improve, but it's also improve a lot of their jet measurements, but it's also worth mentioning that their calorimeter has very poor granularity and their magnetic, field is large so um they have an issue where the charge track if you don't use the tracking information you don't actually know their azimuthal position very well um the sim the first simulations of a particle flow algorithm in s phoenix indicated it would not help very much there's some attempts to do better um and they probably will pay off a little bit, um, but not as much as CMS. All right. So, uh, so what Sarah, about me. Uh, I have a stupid question. You you mentioned the master slide that the fragmentation and the hadronization will influence the unfolding. So my stupid question is: We unfold not to the parton level. We still uh, unfold to the jet level, right? So we, we don't unfold to the original which parton. We, we only unfold to the particle or, or jet level, right? Or we unfold directly to the parton level. You you unfold to the particle level. So you, you what you should do is that you um, let's say you use Pythia. You run your Pythia event through Jayant and then you run your jet finder on the final state particles in Pythia and you run your jet finder on the tracks you reconstructed in that simulation and you match the jets but because your detector response is sensitive to particle type I whatever detector you have your detector response is somewhat sensitive to the particle type so in um, in a lease, for instance, because we don't measure neutrons, if you all of a sudden had, if one plausible variation of the fragmentation function gave you a ton of final state neutrons, or even a large 5%, which is almost double what the default is, your response matrix would not be correct. Um, and that is, somewhat dependent on fragmentation too so at the so the way that the parton shower forms because we know from some studies uh at lep that uh for instance gluons are more likely to fragment into baryons uh or sorry more likely to hadronize into baryons so if you're Fragment if you don't have the parton shower right, or and or you do not get the um, the fragmentation the sorry the hadronization right. If either of those components are wrong, your detector response is going to be wrong. I and this is a little different from a photon because if you actually had a final state photon, you just you had a photon. <laughs> And then everything before generating the photon is the theorist's problem. I see. So it's because many particles fragment to some particle we cannot detect, right? 
not necessarily just that we can't detect them, um, but we're pretty good at measuring charged pions. The charged kaon decays into a, a muon and a neutrino. Um, so we're with a C tau on the order of a meter, I believe. So you always have a lower efficiency for measuring charged kaons than for measuring charged pions simply because of the decays of the charged kaons. I see. Thank you. So, so all of this stuff, because the, let me know if my neighbor's chainsaw habit is in, impeding you being able to hear, um, and then I'll move inside. All of this stuff means that generating this response matrix, like it's, it's probably 95% under control. A lot of it is straightforward but there are these extra little effects and and it's not like people haven't tried to keep keep them under control it's just that it's hard and you know then you throw this all into a heavy ion collision where we think possibly fragmentation and hadronization are changed and you have a bigger uncertainty that's even harder to quantify so if you remember nothing else, jet energy resolution in a detector is fundamentally large because we're measuring multiple correlated particles and that's just hard. That's just not what a particle detector is good at doing. I think you should be skeptical of jet measurements from anyone which have less than 10% uncertainties. And if that is the claim, then they need to talk about the method a lot and why they got uncertainties to cancel out. Um, and unfolding is complicated, often unstable and hard. And this response matrix is, it includes a lot of non-trivial assumptions. So when someone's giving a talk and they just say, well, here we do this, 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 and then we unfold and poof, here's the answer. This should There's be the a lot of questions. Of the talk, right? <laughs> this this should be uh, the between the first and the second half of this sentence should be actually the longest part of the talk. That's what you are saying, right? <laughs> I don't know if it always needs to be the longest part because it depends on the forum. It certainly needs to be in the paper. Yeah. And. I mean, I'm okay with people documenting it somewhere and pointing to an analysis note or a previous paper, but it's it's not trivial and we should constantly reevaluate this. And I see a tendency for people to do one thing once and get a measurement out and then they keep doing what the previous person did without interrogating these assumptions again. And we should, because it's hard. <laughs> right. And, and I, I hope all graduate students hear this, right? I definitely must have heard this before, right? You are not here to push a button or of, 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 of some chain which other, some other people did. You are here to improve upon it what, previous, uh, what people previously did. So a critical look at it and then, okay, so what's your new contribution to the method? I see you smiling, Especially you really agree with me. <laughs> Especially here where this is just a hard measurement. And I also think we shouldn't stop papers forever until we understand everything because we need to publish papers more than once every two decades. Yeah. But there's always something better that could we could do. So this is my soapbox component, which is how I think that we actually, wow, I used a lot of time, um, how I think we actually should compare to models. Um, so we had this, I mentioned it in the first part, the snow mass accord, where basically the summary of talking about jets and what jets are, we came down to apply the same algorithm to data in the model, and then the two are comparable, then you can actually compare them. And there's a 
package called Rivet, which mostly takes the same approach. Apply the same algorithm to data and your model, and then they are comparable. Um, and what is Rivet? So Rivet is a, a piece of code that allows you to standardize comparisons between models and, um, and data. So there's a standard Monte Carlo output format called HEPMC. Rivet takes that in. Um, so that you can write, uh, and then you have an event loop and you loop over all tracks and you can implement your analysis in that. And it also pulls data from uh, the HEP data database so that you can make comparison plots like the one on the bottom showing how the theory in this case in red compares the, to the data in black. Um, why should we do this especially, well, why should we do it in general? Because it makes it really easy to compare models and data. It's not that hard. It preserves analysis details. For JETS in particular, there's a lot of these little finicky analysis details. Did you use a constituent cut? Did you require at least one 5G V hadron? How exactly did you implement your background subtraction algorithm? Did you use an area-based subtraction or did you use the ATLAS iterative method? And if you use Rivet, you're treating the Monte Carlo exactly like the data. So if, you, if your model is correct, then even if your measurement wasn't a measurement of what you wanted to measure, it should still be comparable to the to a calculation done in Rivet. So your measurement, could, your analysis technique could be a little wrong as long as you're wrong the same way in data in Monte Carlo. Um, and we are having a workshop on rivetizing heavy ion collisions um, at RIC, and if you are interested, the goal is that every participant in this week will implement a full analysis in Rivet ready to go to make these comparisons. Um, see the website or contact me if you can be talked into doing this. Um, and I will try to evangelize and convince you to do it. Um, and, you know, when it comes to JETS, this particularly matters because we are actually correcting for these fluctuations in the background, which are also in the, Monte Carlo, but not in the same way as they are in the data. So if you look at something like any of the, well, any of the measurements which have been done of reconstructed jets in heavy ion collisions, they have all been corrected for these detector effects. So if you want to compare to a model like Pythia Angantir or Jetscape in the stream where you're putting all of the particles in into the output, you need to un, you need to do it to treat it exactly the same. What you need to do is input the particles in your Monte Carlo into your jet finding algorithm, get jet candidates, do your background subtraction, you get your raw spectrum, you construct a response matrix just for the fluctuations, which you can do with random cones. And then you unfold your raw spectrum, and then it is comparable to the data. And this is what my postdoc Antonio did. Um, so then you have two streams. So if you have a Monte Carlo generator like Joule that has no background, you skip this unfolding step. If you have a Monte Carlo generator like Pythia Angantir or the default mode for Jetscape, you have to correct for these fluctuations. And then you're unfolding on Monte Carlo, which makes people uncomfortable. But that is what you have to do if you want data in Monte Carlo to be comparable. Um, so because these measurements technique, measurement techniques can bias the measurement, we should be doing we should do exactly the same thing in that data in Monte Carlo. That is my soapbox, and I do want to, part of this point is to make sure, of, the point of this is to make sure that people um, are introduced to things that I think you should know. 
So I did want to touch on where the field is going. Was there a question that I, okay. So this was supposed to be the start of the second day. <clears throat> But I think this has been a useful discussion. So I want to start with, there is no parkonic energy loss. Energy is conserved. So there is only partonic energy distribu redistribution. So if we try to go beyond, you know, thinking of it as the parton loses energy and then the energy just goes away, we want to, try to quantify where it goes. And you guys may have heard this term, jet structure or jet substructure. What is it? Whatever I am measuring, any new jet observable, any observable which measures the structure of jets. So what does the structure of jets mean? It means like where stuff goes when it, when the parton breaks up into, into par other partons and then final state hadrons. That's what I would have naively guessed a cool buzzword, or I don't know, but it gets me talks and grants. Um, if you listen to talks, you, I, I take issue with this word because it is used wildly inconsistently. Um, so I have, I spent a lot of time trying to break down the types of observables into useful types. So like, how do we think about jet observables? Observables which are minimally sen sensitive to the structure. So you're mostly just, you have this picture of energy loss, the parton loses energy, and you, um, it's the energy is either in the cone or out of the cone, but you're not looking at where it went. Things like RAA, which could be jets or single hadrons, um, IAA for dihadron correlations, you're not thinking too much about where the the energy went. And these can be sensitive to the structure and to the way that the jet broke up, but they don't have to be. You, there's, you, you can torture the variables and make them tell you a little bit about jet structure. And then there's observables that are sensitive to the average structure of average jets. So fragmentation functions, because you have a partially inclusive sample of jets uh, and you can you can get at fragmentation functions with dihadron correlations so you're you're sensitive to the same physics um, but you're you're only sensitive to the average shape or structure of the average jet and you're you're the first type is sensitive really to the energy of the particle or the the hadron or the the jet the second type is sensitive to also the constituents, momenta, and their location. The third category is sensitive to the distribution of structures. So you're now not just saying, what is the average width of an average jet, but you know, some measure of, you know, how wide are, what is the distribution of how wide jets are? Quantify it a little bit better but you're really looking at actual, you know, the, some way of looking at the population of all jets. And the fourth category is something different. So this is, these variables are aiming to be sensitive to the parton shower structure. So how did the jet actually break up? And Stuff on the top, types one and two, do not require you to have reconstructed a jet. You can get at these with, uh, you're sensitive to the same physics with correlations, for instance. You don't have to do a full jet reconstruction. Stuff on the bottom, because you need to look at the distribution of jets, you need to have the jets actually reconstructed. Stuff on the top, we can measure to higher precision because it's really closer to what you, you know, it's more what you can measure a detector with. We probably are never going to exceed the precision of single hadron RAA with any type of jet measurement. Stuff on the bottom, 
we'll never be able to measure well because you have to measure correlations between lots of particles. But it may give, it, it may give you sensitivity to different types of models. So um, if you if you look, you know, how do you how can you tell? If you look at the bottom one, the the black points are so category three. The black points are data. The salmon color is jewel, and the cyan color is pythia. There's a clear difference between the model predictions for those two. Uh, I'm not really sure which one. The, the data maybe sit in between the two, but if you just were looking at average, you know, some measure of the average jet width, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell. Um, I think so the fourth category is the one that um, is entirely new. And so I'm going to, uh, and then for the top category, if you're doing jet measurements, average background subtraction is okay, which I think also means that we can measure them better because it's easier to, to get the average of something. The bottom groups, the, the bottom two groups, you need some background subtraction technique that's different because you actually need to be able to say something about the constituents of jets in a high background environment. So if I try to make a greatest hits, and I'm going to rush this because I think it's not that new to most of you. Um, so things in type one, you can sort of look at and say, jets lose energy. Um, you already knew that. Type two, jets get wider and their constituents get softer. Um, so whatever way you measure, and we have measured lot, this lots of ways, that's what those variables are teaching us. Um, let me actually, some of these observables give slightly confusing messages. I'm not going to go through this in detail because I want to get to the interesting part. Um, well, the new part that I think you guys maybe have not seen before. But, you know, here, these, these Elise measurements indicated that jets in heavy ion collisions were slightly more collimated in proton-proton collisions how can that be because jets get wider in the medium? We think that that's because the jets which actually survived interactions with the medium were somewhat more likely to be quark jets, which were, are more likely to fragment narrower. So e interpreting these things is not entirely trivial. And you see here, les sub, uh, you can measure it reasonably accurately, but all of the models agree as well. Like there's, it has, it's something you can measure well, but it has no sensitivity. Um, I think that the, yeah. Sorry, uh, can, I think to this uh, variable also, uh, uh, infrared and collinear are safe. I mean, for the middle no. one, I say they are not, right? If we set collinear separate and the PT square will not be the sum of PT then square, right? These are not infrared. I think they're in. They may be infrared safe. They are not collinear safe. Yeah. Um, so, so that's not the calculable. It means. It means that you cannot calculate it without some because you're really sensitive to the constituents, and that means that you need fragmentation and you're explicitly sensitive to fragmentation. And therefore, it is not perturbative. Okay, so this uh, PT, for example, in the middle one, it's the PT after fragmentation, right? So the, mm -hmm. not the PT at the part time level. So, so the fragmentation will solve the unsafe problem. Okay. 
the the I'm not sure on the infrared. I'd have to think about infrared and safety, but uh, yeah, collinear. I think I, it's most the not look I like think, collinear. I think they're not either, but inherently because you're sensitive to the fragmentation, you're not really going to be able to calculate. Like they're they're not purely perturbative. Okay, thank you. So these slides, I, I want to acknowledge, I brazenly stole them from Laura Havener, who made some beautiful slides. And I'm a firm believer in reducing, reusing, and recycling when making talks. So uh, I do want to introduce this. And I don't have, a, I'd, I'd rather get to people's questions than finish everything. Um, don't be offended if I skip your favorite. So. We want to try to look at the jet splitting. So what you do is that you cluster your jet, usually with the anti-KT algorithm, and then you, in some manner or another, decluster. So this might mean that you run another jet finder, but only on the constituents of the jet. And eventually, it would cluster it all into the same constituent. And then you can unwind so you undo the last step um, and the idea behind this is that then you the cartoon idea is that you're then sensitive to the splitting which occurred at at qcd in qcd so not to the hadronization but to qcd um, and the idea is so now you have in vacuum, wider jets form earlier, um, narrower jets form later. You can get some sense. And then if you add medium, you get more, uh, you get in principle more splittings. So naively in a medium, if you're actually, well, if you're able to resolve the gluon emission, then you would, be sent, you would expect to perhaps see um, that a jet which had two subjets now has three dominant subjets, or that um, maybe that it was two jet subjets that carried almost equal energy. Now there's three carrying almost equal energy among three. Um, you also can have coherent energy loss where the whole jet loses energy to the medium, and then you wouldn't change the structure. And that's what these observables are trying to measure. Um, yeah. That's the idea. Uh, you might even be able to tell from my title that I'm not entirely convinced. Sounds nice. Um, let me skip this. The one you've probably heard of is soft drop grooming. So you reconstruct your jet. The details vary depending on which um, measurement. For instance, with the anti-KT jet finding algorithm with an R of 0.4. Now, you have to subtract the background because you want information about the constituents. So the most common method is something called constituent subtraction. And what you do here is that you add ghosts. But now, when, when we were talking about ghosts, adding ghosts to your jet finding to find the area, um, what you did was, um, your ghosts had very low energies or momenta because you didn't want to interfere with the jet finding. Now, your ghosts have negative momenta corresponding to the average, um, the av what an average constituent would have. And then you look pair by pair, um, and if, and you add, a real track to a ghost, to its nearest ghosts, 
ghost and you either correct the energy of the real track so this blue track is higher than the green one it's closest to so it would have a net positive energy but this red track is lower has a smaller height than its corresponding ghost so you would just eliminate this little red guy but you would also eliminate this little blue guy um which is a real constituent and you wouldn't eliminate this one which is um actually a background particle and then you'd throw into your algorithm what's really the wrong momentum for the blue tracks because you've subtracted off um you've subtracted off a momentum but it like it was a real track um so this is the algorithm which is used it you can look at how it performs in simulation and for most of these observables your average is correct to the the average value you reconstruct is close to the true value um there's another method called area derivatives that i don't have a slide on um uh, sorry so this yeah. it, so this grooming seems also great collinear safety right yes uh, Because yeah, but it's only used in experiment, not in not in calculation. So it's fine, right? They do do calculations. Um, mostly what they're doing is that they're looking at the hardest um, pair. So that's why it's called soft drop. There's different different implementations because you can also so this is ZG is the ratio of the lowest so you you decluster your jet and then but only you only do the last step you only undo the last step now if the last step you look it you look for the z of the lower momentum part of that so if the z is 0.01 you and then you have some threshold so if the z is 0.01 you drop that and you undo the next step and that's where it's the soft part that if the if the last step was if the constituent of the last step was too soft then you keep going because you don't want to look at where uh you know one little tiny hadron maybe finally got sucked up into the right subject you want to tell the main structures apart because they usually use a minimum of point one of z of point one and most of the jet energies that are used i think i think it rick it started a measurement and i think it was a 20 gv jet um whereas uh i think cms is i think i have alice's measurement so it's usually pretty high pt so it's pretty safe to assume that your calculations done with the factorization theorem somehow baked into them are not too far off. And the argument is that you actually can also do this at the parton level because you're sensitive to the, the subjects and not actually the, um, the details of the hadronization. Obviously, you have to be sensitive to hadronization at some level. Um, I think it's really a matter of how sensitive are you. Uh, th thank you. So, what, what's the ZG? This PIG and the PI, PTI and the PTG are already two jets uh, constructed, or it's some patterns? Uh, yeah. So this is the PT of the of the two subjects so you take all of your constituents and you run you take your jet that you want to look at and you recluster the constituents with usually a different algorithm usually it's the cambridge aachen algorithm because it's not sensitive it's not explicitly sensitive to the pt so if you run the game cambridge aachen algorithm on 
a jet, it will eventually throw all of the particles into the same jet. And then you undo the last step because the, these algorithms are iterative. So you just keep going until you run out of particles and then you undo the last iteration. So then you're okay. left with two, two chunks because the last step was to put everything in the same jet, but you just undo that last one. So now you have two jets. So um, PTI would be one of the jets and PTJ would be the other jet. And Z is the, because we normally use Z for the momentum fraction of a hadron, this is Z and the sub G stands for groomed. I see, I see. So this grooming is, in fact, uh, inserted in the JET algorithm. So, yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's just, uh, yeah. in, in some step, we just uh, do the groom. So I, I think so maybe that's why it, it can still be IRC safe, right? Collinear IRC safe. So it, it's just we add more steps. So it, it doesn't mean, yeah. So, so, Maybe, except that as soon as you have a cut, I think that you're not that safe. Okay, I see. I mean, there is some limit where you would no longer, like, if if that last step were actually collinear emission of two gluons, then you would be sensitive. I well, see. I guess that would never be the last step in your jet finder because generally the stuff that's closer together gets clustered first. Yeah, for, re for sequential recombination, our idea is zero, so it will combine first, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it will be the first priority. So for the later process, I think uh, every collinear jet already combined and uh, if we insert it in the step before last one, maybe it should be fine, but I, I, I will check, thank you. Yeah, I, I think you could run into a problem if your jet is only two collinear particles, but yeah. okay. that's an improbable event. Yeah. So this is grooming, and then sometimes what you do is that you groom your jet, and then, and then so meaning that you, only select stuff above this minimum ZG, and then you do another analysis afterwards. Um, or you do something with those two subjects. Okay, we are danger running dangerously close yes, to six o'clock. Yes. So let Next, me. Let me ask something. Uh, yes. Both you and the audience, right? This has been very dense, extremely useful, and basically my question is, do you think that you would be willing, and does the audience think that it would be worth maybe to come back for this one more time sometimes? So I think I was really close to done. Oh, okay. So I think I might, my only, I didn't, I didn't really plug Jetscape, but that was the only core thing that I was going to fit in. I see. Okay, good. Good. Then go ahead and you 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 end it whenever you wish. Okay. Good. Okay. So, if you remember nothing else, jet substructure is used wildly inconsistently in talks, and you have to either badger the speaker or follow closely to try to figure out what they mean by it. Um, we have been doing this search for new observables. I might <clears throat> critique people because we haven't really used the ones we've already measured to their full extent, meaning we haven't done good comparisons between data and theory. So um, I'm not sure that, I think we probably need fewer variables and not more, but to measure ones which are sensitive and which we can measure well. Um, I think it's a mixed bag on these new observables. Uh, and Jetscape is cool. 
yeah, I think maybe I'll just end on the conclusions um, with a, an emphasis on being skeptical, especially because I think that a lot of the talks, especially on jet substructure, are given as if this is definitely the future and everything is totally perfectly clear and understood and beautiful and every measurement was done exactly right and we should be very skeptical of that if we've learned nothing else from dihadron correlations it's that we don't always know what we're doing all right i think we had questions that's i think i'm done if unless okay. there's a few questions Any questions? Um, I have a quick one. You said people are afraid to unfold Monte Carlo. Why is that? I don't know if... So, afraid might not be the right word. Um, Unfolding is complicated. We like to think that when you do stuff with Monte Carlo, like you're working in a model, everything's neat and it's clean and it's straightforward. And as soon as you have to add unfolding, you're adding an uncertainty. Um, you're doing a procedure which is not entirely straightforward. So, for instance, we don't envision adding it to rivet because um, you can't write a script and guarantee that unfolding comes out right. It needs some checks. It, I don't want to say by hand, you need to put your eyes on it and make sure it didn't do something completely bizarre. Be, because it, if you apply an unfolding algorithm, it will give you an answer that answer is not necessarily right. So you kind of have to look at it and sanity check. Um, and I think that people, some fraction of the field, especially one very vocal person, views this as impugning the measurements that were already done as opposed to okay well we're in this process of learning how to do things it said vocal person also um thinks you should not have background in a Monte Carlo, in a model, and therefore you just should know what the right particles are, what is your signal. And so if, you're, if your signal is clearly defined, you don't need to do background subtraction, you only put the right particles into your algorithm. I, I think that this is a simplistic notate, notion of theory, and I will note that many theorists also think that the theory is not that straightforward. It's also new, and I think that new things take a while to get your head wrapped around. Okay. If no other questions, then I stop.